Um, so it's now recording. So again, we just want to welcome everybody for this talk. So I'm going to hand over to Grant. Do you want to begin or is it Sylvia starting? How do you? Sure, no, I, I'll start. I'm not sure if I got the details right in any way. That's okay. That's okay. Let's, um, so I, I know we are fixed to one hour firm. So in, in order to leave time for questions and answers afterwards, let's, um, I'll, I'll try and be as brief as possible. Um, I think many of us grew up uh, with grandparents that didn't talk about their past. Um, that obviously had substantial pain and never told us why. And I was fascinated with genealogy, uh, my hobby's Jewish history. Um, and I always took an interest in what my grandfather called the old country. And Lithuania regained independence in 1990, and I was one of the very first tourists that set foot in a freed Lithuania. Um, it, it, it had been a, a lifetime fixation for me that, that I wanted to honor my grandfather in the country he was from. So I started going to Lithuania. It was compellingly interesting. Uh, and I didn't really comprehend the history. So I started visiting the different death pits and I noticed that the cemeteries, the Jewish cemeteries really weren't visible. A lot of them were overgrown, um, going back to nature. So I decided to restore the cemetery in my grandfather's village. It's a, it's a very long, complicated story. They, they wouldn't allow me to. And I came to understand that letting the cemeteries go back to nature was a way of hiding them. Because if people saw Jewish cemeteries and they would say, well, where are the Jews that lived here that had all these cemeteries? And then people would notice they were absent. So, so letting the cemeteries go back to nature was, was an agenda item. Anyway, to, 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 to cut this short, I was in my grandfather's village um, going to one of the death pits and um, I was with an academic and I, I wanted to say Kaddish over, there were, there were three death pits in my grandfather's village and I wanted to say Kaddish at, at all three of them to memorialize my cousins that have to be in those specific death pits. And after we said, after I said Kaddish, I, I said to the academic, you know, we know what happened here. We, we know that they, they, generic they, came in and murdered everybody. But who actually pulled the trigger? Who did the killing? And the academic said to me, it was a man by the name of Jonas Noreka. She didn't hesitate. She didn't have to think. She said straight out, there was a man by the name of Jonas Noreka that is responsible for all the murders in this region. So I noted the name down. I came back to the United States and I started researching Jonas Noreka. And I found out that in 1984, um, six years before Lithuania regained independence, Noreka was exposed as the murderer. So I research him further and find out that he's one of Lithuania's greatest national heroes. So I thought this, this can't be right. Um, you can't have a man that, that was a genocidal mass murderer of thousands and thousands of people. At that stage, I didn't even know how many people he'd murdered. Um, so I thought, okay, the Lithuanian government has made a mistake. So I thought, if I just tell them and show them the details, they'll recoil in horror and say, oh, wow, we've made this, this awful mistake. 
We're going to revoke his heroes, uh, his, his, his national hero status. And it's a terrible thing. So I started contacting different government agencies and saying, look, guys, you, you've made a mistake over here. Um, rectify it. These, the, there's no doubt as to the fact that he was the murderer. The, he signed documents were published by the German government in, in the 1980s. And there are no answers. Nobody, nobody's willing to answer me back. So I go to the president's office and I go to the prime minister's office and I go to the parliamentary ombudsman. Um, I go to the mayor of Vilnius. I, from, from department to de department and there's just silence and rebuffing me. So um, I eventually hired an attorney. And I said, you know what, it, it's clear, it's clear that this is actually deliberate. They, they're not ignoring me because I'm some foreign crank. They're ignoring me because actually they know. So they have, Lithuania has a government department called the Genocide Center, which is supposed to research and report on uh, the Nazi genocide and the Soviet occupation. Um, and I contact them and there is straight up Holocaust revisionism, denial, uh, inversion of facts. And then I realize this is pure anti-Semitism. Well, you know, from those of us that grew up in South Africa, uh, that came from some of that revolutionary stock, we don't really tolerate Jew hate that well. So I decided, okay, I'm, I'm going to confront this. So I began to confront the government and it became more and more adversarial. And the government finally responded to me and said, if I don't like their research, then I should do my own research. And I did. And my researchers discovered about 100 documents. Each one of those documents would individually be sufficient to convict Noreka of, of genocide. Uh, and they, they denied, ignored, uh, or inverted all of them. So finally, I sued the government. Um, and the story kept getting bigger and bigger because as I discovered how they inverted the truth on Noreka, so I discovered that he wasn't the only one. There is a program in Lithuania to convert Holocaust perpetrators into national heroes to deny the culpability of Lithuanians in the genocide of Lithuanian Jews. Uh, so this, this, this is ongoing year after year after year. And... Um, so one day I am at my computer in my office and an email pops up on my computer and it says, hello, Mr. Goshen. My name is Sylvia Foti. I assume you know who I am. And I knew exactly who Sylvia Foti was. Sylvia Foti is the granddaughter of Jonas Noreka, the man that is guilty of murdering approximately 100 members of my Jewish Lithuanian family. So with that brief summary, why don't I hand this to Sylvia and let you describe some of this. Okay, thank you, Grant. 
Um, I uh, grew up in Chicago and in a Lithuanian community. Uh, I went to kindergarten, not speaking any English because um, my parents raised me very Lithuanian. And I uh, was raised to hear that my grandfather, Jonas Nareka, was a wonderful hero. Um, he died in a KGB prison by the communists, uh, tortured for two years. So he died at the age of 36, a young martyr for the cause. Uh, before that, he had led um, a rebellion against the communists. And this is where he uh, came up with the name General Storm. It's a code name. And that's uh, shortly after that, the KGB found him and imprisoned him. Before that, um, he was in a Nazi concentration camp for nearly two years at Stutthof. Before that, he uh, was the district chief of Shaule during the Nazi occupation. And the version I always grew up with was that he was just always helping the Lithuanians and he was sort of acting as a double agent, working for the Lithuanians, but really being an anti-Nazi. Before that, he led uh, this five-day uprising against the communists and in Jamaitia, the northwestern part of Lithuania, and he won. He got the country back from the communists. And so, he was this wonderful man who I always looked up with, I revered. Uh, and my mom was asked in Chicago to write a book about him from the Lithuanian community here. And so since the 1970s, she had been collecting material and archiving it. Uh, then in the 1990, when Lithuania got its independence, she took several trips to Lithuania to get more material and she's always gonna be working on this book. Well, in the year 2000, at the age of 60, she uh, landed in the hospital again. She, she had diabetes and a bad back and had been periodically going to the hospital. So it was not unusual that she went to the hospital and I thought she would just come right out again. Uh, but the day I went to visit her in late January 2000, uh, she looked horrible. She looked really, really bad and I was, I was scared. And, um, she took my hand and she said, Sylvia, you have to write the book. And um, I knew exactly what book she was talking about. I had been a journalist uh, for 20 years at that point. It was only later I became a high school teacher. So, but I still said, no, 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 no. You're, you're gonna be fine, mom. You know, you're gonna come back home and, and you're gonna write the book. And uh, she continued to hold my hand and said, you have to do it. Everybody expects this book. And I just looked out the window, it was snowing. And I, I wanted, I didn't wanna say yes, but when you're, your mother who's dying asked you something, of course, there's only one response. And so I said, yes. The next day I came back and she was already in a coma. And uh, two weeks later, she had died on February 4th, 2000. So it was a terrible time. This is 20 years ago now. It was a terrible time. I, you know, she was very young. I was 38 then, she was only 60. I'm approaching 60 myself now. And um, I started to embrace this project thinking, well, it'll, you know, it'll get me close to my parents' homeland, their her the heritage. I would like to know more about my grandfather. And I, and I started to really welcome this project. Um, my grandmother, my mother's mother was still alive. She had survived her daughter. She's the wife of uh, Jonas Nareka. And um, so it's July, about five months later, and I'm visiting her. And she, um, I visit her at her home. She, she lived like 10 blocks away from my home. And, uh, and then she took my hand 
and said, what's going on with the book? And I said, don't worry, uh, grandmother, I'll, everything's fine. I'm, I'm young. I'm not going to let it go. Like mom, let it go. I'm going to work on it. Don't you worry. And that's when she says, don't write the book. Just let history lie. There's no reason to dig around in there. And I said, what? What do you mean don't write the book? I promised mom I have to write the book. How could you say not write the book? Of course I'm gonna write the book. And she just turned over and faced the wall and you know, gave me her back and I left. And I didn't know what to make of that request. And I, and I thought maybe she just wanted to let me off the hook, you know, because it was a big project for my mother. And, you know, maybe she, I, I only thought the best of her intentions. I only thought her intentions were good. And uh, then she died within two weeks after that. Um, and both of them had asked if they could be buried in Lithuania. So um, they were cremated. And my brother, who's in California, uh, and I flew to Lithuania to bury their to bury their remains, their cremains, and uh, we buried them in Vilnius. And um, I, and then after that, uh, my brother and I were invited to visit the school named after our grandfather. Well, well, There's a grammar school. Uh, uh, actually, may, may I interrupt you for one moment? Sure. You know, when you went to, when, when you had the funeral ceremony, the president of Lithuania came, came to the funeral. He was the first president, yeah. The first president. His name was Landsbergis. Right. And, and there is an Australian connection to this. So just for we, we can refer to this actually in later on in this in this program why didn't you tell them what he said to you um he said uh thank you for bringing the remains of your mother and your grandmother to lithuania um we're very honored um you know as your grandmother was the widow of jonas nareka and your mother was the daughter of jonas nareka this is this is very important and our country needs heroes. And it was a beautiful gesture. You know, I was, we were so honored that he came to pay his respects. Um, and um, shortly after that, my brother and I went to visit the school named after our grandfather, the Jonas Nareka Grammar School in Shukone, Northern Lithuania. And uh, we get there, the children have flowers in their hands and you know they're really greeting us they went all out we felt like rock stars walking in there and um the director takes us into uh his office all the teachers are standing around and uh he's got a scrapbook of my grandfather and i'm just kind of flipping through the pages and he says thank you so much for agreeing to write the book for your mother again our country needs heroes you're such a good daughter for doing this and i said thank you and um, and then I said, you know, I as long as I'm here, why don't you tell me how you named the school after my grandfather? How did this come about? And he said, well, uh, before 1990, the school had a Russian name, and we wanted to get rid of that name, so uh, we wanted to give it a good Lithuanian name. And your grandfather was born right here, so his name came up right away in the discussions. And so it was just a natural, we, we wanted to name the school after him. And I said, oh, that's, that's nice, that's a nice story. And I thought that would be the end of it. And then he takes me to the side and he said, but you know, we got a lot of grief over naming the school after your grandfather. And I said, what do you mean you got a lot of grief? He said, because of what the Jews were saying. And I said, what could the Jews possibly say? about my grandfather. And he looked at me like I'm the one from Mars. And he said, well, he was accused of killing Jews. And that was the first time I had ever heard that. I had never heard that before. And I almost fainted. Uh, you know, I broke out in a sweat. My, my heart was beating really fast and, and I had to sit down. 
uh, and catch my breath. And he could see I'm, you know, upset. And then he's, he's starting to try to soothe me. And he says, but that's okay. It's okay. It's all in the past. You don't have to worry about that anymore. It's all in the past. Um, and then, uh, then I came back to Chicago and I started asking my relatives, my father, uh, friends, my mother's friends. I'm like, have you ever heard this the, about um, Jonas Nareka having any to do with killing Jews? And they said, oh, that's, that's nothing. It's timing is propaganda. Don't, don't listen to that. It's, it's just nothing. And uh, the Russians just made that up and, and they're just feeding that. It's just propaganda. And I thought, oh, Okay, but you know, it's funny that I never heard this. Like everybody, it seemed like everybody else had heard this except me. And, um, and you know, I worked on this story on the side. Uh, at the time I was still a journalist and I had my own freelance writing business then. And I was working on all kinds of other things, uh, a family, two young children. So this was just a side project. And I kind of let it languish a little bit. But by the time I picked it up again, it was a few years later, um, I thought, well, if I'm really gonna do this story, and I know I am because it was a promise to my mother, um, maybe I can exonerate him. Maybe I can prove that he had nothing to do with the Jews. I knew I couldn't ignore it. As a journalist, I just knew I could not ignore it. Much as the granddaughter wanted to ignore it, the journalist knew I had to address it. Um, so that's sort of the beginning of the story and how I got really involved in it. I thought this might be a good way to have you jump in, Grant. Okay, so, so I hired, uh, when, when the government rebuffed me, and they rebuffed me very strongly. I hired um, a PhD uh, researcher to research in the Lithuanian language because I don't speak Lithuanian. Um, and I hired a second researcher to do the research in the Russian language because calling somebody a murderer is a very big charge. And calling somebody a genocidal mass murderer is an even bigger charge. So when the government rebuffed me as strongly as they did, I needed to be extra certain I was on solid ground. So what I used to spend an hour a day on suddenly became five or six hours a day and has been for very many years already. Um, so I hired these two researchers. They examined close to 20,000 documents in total. And they came up with, with Noreka's signature on multiple documents, on, on, on multiple orders to build concentration camps, to, to make Jews wear the yellow star, to plunder Jewish property. Um, there's absolutely no doubt about the case whatsoever. The, the Germans, when they reported in 1984, uh, they were absolutely on totally solid ground. And it became impossible to get truth out of the Lithuanian government. And the only means of addressing this was in a court. Unfortunately, Lithuanian courts are not known for legitimacy. They sell their verdicts. They take political instructions on how to rule. Um, Lithuania remains a, a very Soviet mentality country rather than a European mentality country. And so it turns out that one of the researchers made contact with Sylvia and asked Sylvia to make contact with me. Um, it was very difficult. It was, it, it was, initially it was very difficult when, when Sylvia made contact with me because I had read some of her writing uh, from 20 years earlier 
and it was this very nationalistic um my grandfather was a hero um so when sylvia contacted me i i was i was more than a little suspicious of her and so when she when when i received that email i i was shaking i i i broke out in a sweat i was having palpitations it was you know when, when you when you spend your childhood growing up with three grandparents from the baltics and you've heard just some of the stories having the granddaughter of the murderer contact you is 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 a little shocking so i get on the line with sylvia and i'm ready to be hostile and she says to me i've read all of your research because i make all of my research public so i said yes she says i agree with almost all of it i'm like yeah where's the other shoe and she says but you've missed but you've made one very significant error so i said all right what is that she says you've missed approximately 10000 of my grandfather's victims and when she made that comment all my defenses got blown away then she says to me that she's written a book about her research would i like to read it so i said yes you know i at this point i'm i'm pretty knowledgeable about noreka there there isn't there isn't much about him i haven't studied um but let's see let's see what's in her book so she emails me her book and i started reading it and and i sat down in in the same room i'm in right now and i did not get up until i finished reading her manuscript it, it when when her book is is released i it it is the most compelling some of the most compelling reading that that i've done in many years and sylvia just peels back the layers of the fraud um every defense i had against sylvia crumbled after i read that book because it it contained facts that i didn't know before and it validated everything i did know before so sylvia agreed to provide testimony in my next lawsuit that 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 was coming up in the lithuanian courts so sylvia writes a letter of testimony that says i've examined uh all of my research and it is correct my grandfather was a genocidal mass murderer of jews uh grand gushin is correct and the Gen and the, the lithuanian government is is fraudulent well the government said that sylvia had been born after the war so they were dismissing her testimony plus she di sylvia disagreed with her mother now her mother had died 20 years before but sylvia disagreed with her mother so they were discrediting everything that sylvia said um and we're not going to examine her testimony um we've had four lawsuits since then they have still refused to look at any of sylvia's testimony um through this process we have uncovered so so when sylvia contacts me she says to me what they've done with my grandfather is the biggest criminal cover up of the 20th century at that point sylvia only knew about her grandfather she didn't know about the other dozen heroes that i have documented that were also holocaust perpetrators um we've uncovered a substantial effort by the lithuanian government to revise holocaust history and substitute it with a nationalist narrative which 
doesn't deny the Holocaust. It just denies the participation of some of their greatest national heroes. So this, the status at this moment in time is we have been through every court in Lithuania and we are now going to the European Court of Human Rights um, because there is no path to truth uh, within Lithuania. Um, it's just come out over the past few days that Lithuania has installed um, a well-known Holocaust revisionist and uh, anti-Semite as one of their chief historians. Um, he's known to come up with the most absurd conclusions and then to try and figure out how to fill in the research to validate the conclusions. So at this point in time, Lithuania has been clearly identified internationally as a Holocaust distorting state. Um, fully validated by their legal system and participated in uh, by their parliament and government institutions. So without Sylvia's help, it would have been close to impossible. With Sylvia's help, we expect um, the European court to to issue a comprehensive uh, conclusion. There have been a number of international organizations that have been watching this closely. The World Jewish Congress has, has condemned uh, the Lithuanian government. The American Jewish Committee um, put out a statement recently and the Lithuanian government responded by calling it hostile propaganda. So, you know, the, the, the facts have been established and are clear. And at this point in time, it's just a matter of uh, legally defining them for what they are because publicly they've already been defined. So, Rabbi, with that, why don't we, why don't we open this for, for some questions? Lovely. Um, so, yeah, so if anybody will start with, if people want to type questions in, I've got a few that I was thinking, um, which might be of interest to others as well, if that's okay. Um, okay. And then if people want to send through questions, they can. Um, um, so the first one is uh, to both of you, I guess. Um, uh, obviously, this is a massive undertaking that you've both done in a, just curious in terms of your own personal safety and fear. I mean, obviously, we're dealing with the government and Obviously, it's not a spy movie, but but is there, has there ever been any sort of concern for your own physical safety taking on a government like Lithuania, who clearly doesn't really have a, a moral compass? Has that ever played into this um, this equation at all? Sylvia, do you want to answer first, or sure? Um, well, my uh, website was banned on Facebook for about a year. Uh, and it took it took a lot to get it back on Facebook. Uh, so there's that. I did have um, a death threat uh, come in via email, um, and he was from Sweden. But um, and and uh, I've lost uh, some friends over this. Uh, my father and his side of the family uh, wishes I would not do this. Um, I do get a lot of pushback from Lithuanians here in Chicago. And um, there is pushback by, by Lithuanians in Lithuania too. Um, I think this story has blindsided them. They did not see it coming. Uh, when it first broke out in 2018, you know, I was, up, I had finished the book in 2018 and um, I had compiled everything. I had had, you know, a trip to Lithuania. I was there for seven weeks during the summer in 2013. And that took me another five years 
to rewrite and rewrite and rewrite and rewrite until I could get it right. It's a very complicated story and I had a very difficult time figuring out how to tell it. Um, and, um, you know, I needed uh, a literary agent and they told, uh, you know, and by that point I had been rejected many times and they told, and I had been told I have to get a uh, author platform. And so um, that's when I made my website in 2018, early 2018. And it was Grant's researcher who found me through my website. And, he, and it was his researcher who said I should contact Grant. And I was very scared about contacting Grant. It took me a long time, it took me six weeks to get up the nerve to call him. But um, I know I went way off topic of your, of your question. There, it's, it's been, it's, been very uncomfortable so so let me let me answer that from my from my side um, the Lithuanian government threatened me with criminal charges publicly those threats still exist on a government website uh, I filed a complaint with the government the government has never told me what the criminal charges would be for um, and they won't tell me whether they are pursuing them or not pursuing them. Um, when Sylvia's website was shut down as a hate site, Lithuania has what they call elves who are supposed to target anybody that speaks out against Lithuania and shut those sites down. I've received multiple, I've received multiple death threats over the years. Um, you know, but Lithuanians tend to be brave when a Jew's on the ground and they've got a club in their hand. When a Jew stands up uh, with equal strength to confront them, they usually run away. So, um, you know, they, they do, there was a woman by the name of Ruta Vanagaita who, who's also written a, a very good book, which is, is worth reading. She had to leave Lithuania for three years for fear of a physical safety. People would come up to her and spit at her in the street. Um, the government, they have a law in Lithuania that nobody's allowed to defame any of the country's heroes. So when we identify the country's heroes as, as murderers and thieves, um, we are speaking ill of their national heroes, and that is criminal. They, they have prosecuted people for that. Um, so people that speak out are generally intimidated, but Lithuania is not a country where people speak out against the government. Um, so there's a lot of there's 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 a lot of silent objections. Um, there's a lot of people that would like to see this rectified, but unfortunately, the Jew haters have the upper arm in Lithuania. You know, but there there is a question from Deb Ellenbogen um, on here that uh, she says, Grant, you mentioned a link to Australia. Can you please explain? And actually, this leads into the exact question you asked. There is a link to, in, in this whole story to, to Australia. So what happened was the Soviets left um, Lithuania because the Germans were, were coming in. And Lithuania says they left because it was an uprising. Well, they left. It wasn't the Lithuanian uprising that caused the Soviets to leave. It was the Nazis coming in that caused them to leave. But um, the, the vast majority of the murders were committed by Lithuanians, not by Nazis. There were, there were very few Nazis uh, stationed in Lithuania. It was Lithuanians that did the roundups, that did the plundering, that, and did the murdering. And when the Nazis started to leave Lithuania because the Russians were coming back, a large number of the perpetrators moved west along with the Nazis. And there were a large number of murderers and Holocaust perpetrators that went into the displaced persons camps in Europe 
and claimed to be running away from the communists. And Australia let in a number of Lithuanians under the guise of they were running away from the communists. One of the people that Australia let in was named Vitautus Zemkalnus Landsbergus. Now, we actually mentioned the name Landsbergus earlier because that was the first president of independent Lithuania who came up to Sylvia and said, our country needs heroes. And the person that entered Australia was his father. So Zemkalnus Landsbergus signed the orders for the first concentration camp for Jews in Lithuania. He's clearly a Holocaust perpetrator under any definition. Australia prohibited Holocaust perpetrators from entering after the war. So there is no way that he could have been truthful on his immigration record. He's dead, so his immigration can't be revoked. But imagine if his immigration documents were uncovered, and hopefully there's somebody on this call that knows how to use the Australian archives and could try and find those records. Um, it would be an earthquake in Lithuania if the Australian parliament identified that as a fraudulent immigration and posthumously revoked his Australian citizenship. There were a large number of Holocaust perpetrators, Lithuanian Holocaust perpetrators that came to Lithuania. There were a large number of Holocaust perpetrators, Lithuanian Holocaust perpetrators that came to the United States. There was a project in the US called Operation Paperclip where these people said uh, they knew how to fight the communists, so they were going to be of assistance to the US government. Um, two of, two, two of Zimkalnus Landsbergis' compatriots in that provisional government, um, one of whom also signed the order for, for that concentration camp, came to the United States. Lithuania took US congressional documents and completely inverted their meaning and made the claims that the US Congress had completely exonerated him, which was an out and out lie. Um, I brought this to the attention of, of US Congress, how a supposedly allied foreign government was fraudulently misusing congressional documents. Um, and the US Congress issued a statement uh, to instruct them to stop. Um, simply, they, they are shameless in, in, in their deceptions. Um, there, is, there, there is a large Lithuanian community in, in Australia. Um, the descendants are not guilty for the crimes of their parents, but a number of their parents were murderers of our families. Thank you for that. So, uh, yeah, quite a few questions. Oh, and, and sorry, wait, let me add one, one thing to that, please. Sure. Um, now, Lance Burgess, the first, the first president of independent Lithuania that came up to Sylvia and said, your grandfather was a hero, we need heroes. When that woman, Ruta Vanagaita, started speaking out in Lithuania about the truth of history of Lithuanians murdering Jews, he stated publicly that she should go to the forest and hang herself. <laughs> and so Ruta started receiving multiple death threats, drawing nooses around her neck, uh, based on the words of the first president. This is... This is the son of the person that signed the orders for the first concentration camp in Lithuania. Wow. Um, 
So, Grant, somebody sent me a message asking, are you familiar with the work of a Danny Ben Moshe? Yes. Yes. So, just curious, someone said, you know, obviously they, their documentary was on the lines of exposing these uh, untruths. Uh, yes. So, I don't know if that's, if, if that's been of any help to you or not. Danny's a great guy. His documentary is well worth watching. Um, he's accurate. And um, I think his, his documentary is probably seven, eight, nine years old already. I think it is on YouTube. And, and I recommend people watch it. I think he's at, there's a university, Monash, Monash. Yes, correct, Monash, that's right. Yeah, I think he teaches there. Yeah, so maybe he might be of help to, you know, how to get in touch with the Australian side of, you know, obviously he's done research and he probably would have contacts in that, in that regard. Um, a couple of other questions that are coming through um, before we get to the ones on the chat, but um, Israel, have they had any or provided you any assistance to try and uncover this? Certainly you would think they would want to or possibly not. I don't know. You know, Israel has its own strategic issues and Israel needs allies and Lithuania offers their vote at the UN. So Israel takes a position, they don't go after their friends. So when it comes to Holocaust issues, um, Israel is concerned about living Jews and uh, we get more help from the German and Austrian government than we do from the Israeli government. Wow, that's, that's pretty disturbing. Yes. Um, Sylvia, if somebody's asking how your children um, have, have taken all of this news and, you know, the public eye of it all. Um, they're not in the public eye. My son, my son is not in the public eye. Yeah. Um, he's 22 and he understands everything that's happening, but he's not really... I have to say he's not affected by it. So it's only really coming out toward me and he's been left alone. Yeah. Thankfully. Okay. Fair enough. Um, Grant, this is an interesting question, obviously. Um, certainly wouldn't be cheap to be doing what you guys are doing. Is this, is this something that you're funding yourself or how, how, are, you, how are you getting through all this? Um, I have self-funded this entire thing. I... Wow. Um, I've done the work myself. I funded it. There's, there's, there's uh, one entity called the Israeli American Civic Action Network um, that stepped in a few months ago uh, to assist. They have uh, taken a political uh, direction on this. We're not getting a, morally. Lithuania is is bankrupt. There is no. There is no hope of, of a moral position coming from Lithuania. Legally, they are bankrupt. Um, so the only resolution that this uh, Israeli-American Civic Action Network is seeing is, 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 is actually a political solution. So they have taken this and um, shown the details to a number of political leaders. And just in the past few weeks, the city of Beverly Hills has issued a uh, resolution condemning Lithuania, the city of West, of West Hollywood. And two weeks ago, the city of Los Angeles issued a resolution of condemnation. Um, there are a number of other cities in the United States that have approached us as the stories become public um, and uh, are also considering uh, resolutions. Um, you know, what, what I would like Jews to know is that if the Lithuanian government is communicating something to do with Jewish history or Jews in Lithuania, that there is an agenda that people are not seeing, such as marketing the country for tourism 
or substituting a positive story to uh, deflect from uh, the rest of the details going on, or it is straight up dishonest. Um, it, it, it's very unfortunate because the foreign minister of Lithuania is actually a, a, a decent guy, but unfortunately he operates in, in much of a vacuum and he can't change the whole country. So the foreign diplomats, the, the ambassador to Australia is, the Lithuanian ambassador to Australia is tasked with outreach to Jews. Uh, much of that outreach is dishonest. The Lithuanian ambassador to South Africa is tasked with outreach to Jews. It is almost universally dishonest. Um, Jews should know that the messages that the government of Lithuania are sending are almost universally dishonest. Um, and if, if, if that is the totality of my accomplishments for for 10 years of work just on exposing their Holocaust revisionism, that to me would be satisfactory. Interesting, because that was going to be my next question. Uh, and Sylvia, just if you could also just um, tell us about your book. Um, I, I think I did put it on the flyer, but do you have a copy there that you can sort of show to the screen? I'm not sure if you have one handy. It's not out yet. Oh, it's not um, out yet. No, it's, it's called The Nazi's Granddaughter, and it's available for pre-orders okay. at this time in Amazon. So it's only coming out next spring. Okay. Uh, a Spanish edition is coming out sooner, but because of COVID, everything's being delayed. But it's called The Nazi's Granddaughter, How I Learned My Grandfather uh, Was a War Criminal. Okay, that'll be very interesting to read when it comes out. And, and, and it's a compelling read. I'll tell you that. We had a speaker a few weeks ago, um, um, Dr. Bernd Volschlager, who, who converted to Judaism. He discovered his grandfather was a Nazi. And um, I don't know if you've heard of him. And a very interesting story. He, he lives in Florida at the moment, um, had made Aliyah, and also a very compelling story. And it's amazing to, I mean, Sylvia, it's, it's, and of course, Grant, not taking away from your efforts, obviously, but to, sure. to, to hear your story, Sylvia. And, and as Bernd said the other, the, other, the other week, it's, it's so admirable that you are prepared to fight this fight. You know, it's, it's, it's incredible. Thank Sylvia's you. Sylvia's a very brave lady. Yes. Um, so we've got quite a few questions that are being posted. If, are you happy to just go for a few more minutes to, to try sure. to them? Um, uh, so somebody, um, somebody's asking, are you aware of any Lithuanians that skipped the country to North America? Oh, yes. Many. Provoked? Wait, are you, are you, wait, am I, oh, that skipped the country to North America, identified as Jew killers, that yes, there were, there were a number of uh, perpetrators that were denaturalized. Um, and there were some that were actually sent back to Lithuania. Um, unfortunately, Lithuania has not punished one single murderer of a Jew since they regained independence. They received some of them back. Um, they delayed prosecution or until these people died or used other strategies. But independent Lithuania did not punish a single Holocaust perpetrator. Wow, that's shocking. Um, the number of somebody's Brian, I don't know if you can see the question there. I don't know if you've seen at the Genocide Museum, the description in the Holocaust section stipulates there was 30 to 40,000 Jews murdered at Penarai. What is the actual number? So the actual, the, the 70,000 Jews and 30,000 non-Jews. Hmm. So, so, so it's, it's, it's in the Penari forest right outside of the capital city. Um, yeah, and most of the data comes from one Lithuanian that lived nearby that kept a diary that registered uh, some of the numbers being murdered. So the Genocide Museum is simply a fraudulent entity. Uh, it's, it's, it's the government agency for the government of Lithuania to rewrite the history. Um, 
I actually published a, an, an op-ed in Times of Israel yesterday. So if you, if, if you go onto Times of Israel, enter my name, um, Sylvia, what was the title? Do you remember? I only I published remember. I only published it yesterday and I've already forgotten the title of the uh, I'll just look I, for, I, who, for Grant Goshen. I'm sorry? Look, they should look for Grant Goshen, your yes. the author. Yeah. In the blog and, section. And it's the it's the one from yesterday. And I describe what the genocide museum is. Um, they are tasked with uh, revising history to come up with a guilt-free Lithuania. It is, it, it is simply a fraudulent entity uh, defined as such by multiple international organizations. Right. Um, what, what do you, what do you, I mean, I guess you're not a prophet, but what do you en in, envision will be the sort of the conclusion to this, if there ever is gonna be one? This generation, this, the current generation that's in power, look, the young people of Lithuania are really decent people. They, 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 they're good people. The young, young Lithuanians uh, know what the facts are. They, they have access to the internet. They have access to books. They know what their grandparents were and what their parents are doing. I think it's going to take this generation to die out before truth is introduced in Lithuania. Um, I feel desperately sorry for the youth of Lithuania, who, it's a dying country. One third of, one third of the population of the country have, have pretty much evacuated the country. Um, the country is dependent on European Union aid. Um, it, it, it's still very much a Soviet state. So, you know, the, the, the youth of Lithuania is, I feel sorry for them. Yeah. Um, eventually truth will out, um, but it's going to take a long time. It's going to take people like Sylvia, like Ruta Vanagaita, people like me, Jews are, are simply the enemy. Uh, they will never listen to us. They negate, if it, to them, if a Jew is speaking, it, it might as well be Satan. Um, it's going to take Lithuanians themselves to change, uh, to change that society. And at the end of the day, when, when Lithuania recognizes people like Sylvia as their national heroes instead of Sylvia's grandfather, that's when you will know that Lithuania has become a normal country. Well, that's a very powerful way of putting it. Um, for, for the, obviously, we've come, we, we, we are just after 12.30, but a question which I think a lot of people would be wondering, those of us who've had the privilege to listen to the story live here on Zoom, on Facebook, and those who will watch it afterwards, what can, what can people do in this, like, you know, for this specific cause? Is there anything people can do yes. to, assist, to assist in this way? Yes. I, I, you know what? Let me, let me give two asks over here. And I don't know how many people are watching or how many people will watch afterwards. If somebody can get hold of the immigration records for Zimkalnis Landsbergis, um, the evidence that he was a Holocaust perpetrator is, is a given. Uh, if Australia acknowledged that he immigrated under false pretenses, that would cause an earthquake in Lithuanian society. So that's ask number one, if, 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 if anybody on the Zoom could, could figure out how to access those records. Ask number two is, I really don't have contacts in, in Australia. If we could get Sydney, the city of Sydney and the city of Melbourne um, and the city of Perth to also pass resolutions 
condemning Lithuanian Holocaust revisionism. Um, it would put it would put these items on the public record. Um, Lithuania will not acknowledge facts. They ignore. They they will completely ignore that today's Zoom happened or any of the other Zooms happened. They will completely ignore. Um, when the case goes to the European court. But when a city like Sydney passes a resolution uh, acknowledging the facts as acknowledged by Yad Vashem and um, the Holocaust Museum in Washington DC and the Simon Wiesenthal Center, just simple acknowledgement of facts, that will make an impact. So. If were I to ask today's audience for assistance, it's A, in, 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 in finding those immigration records, and B, if you have lobbyists that you can help us take these resolutions to public entities, please make contact with me. Um, it is the only path we can see to them ever telling the truth. Thank you for that, Grant. And how, how could people get in touch with you, Grant? Uh, first initial G, last name Goshen. So it's G Goshen, G G O C H I N, at gmail.com. Fantastic. Sylvia, any final uh, remarks that you want to? Um, it, obviously, you've inspired all of us, I think, um, you know, for your bravery and for standing up for the truth. Um, anything you'd like us to do for, for, you know, for you to feel that you've, you've, done, you've done good work? You know, um... You, you, you are tuning in from a synagogue, correct? Yeah. And uh, so you are prayerful people. And uh, I'm, I'm a practicing Catholic. So my ask is that you pray that Lithuania do the right thing and acknowledge its role in the Holocaust. Thank you. That's, That's what I would ask. That's very powerful as well. So look, thank you to the two of you for your really eye-opening stuff. And um, it's crazy to think... Um, what's you know what they are denying and, and continue to deny even in 2020 um so thank you for your efforts and yes if anyone who's watching can assist grant in that way i'll speak to some of the politicians that i know to see if they have any um, influence or interest in taking up the story um and hopefully the media picks it up in australia as well i uh, hope that, that would be fabulous perhaps we can put you in touch with the australian jewish news to to do some type of story as well they actually have written a couple of stories about this over the last few years. Okay, good. I'm sorry I missed them. But if we can take it bigger than that, that would also be great, I'm assuming. Yes. Well, thank you everybody for joining us. And just a little bit of a plug for uh, another event coming up this week. Um, Wednesday night, we have a very fascinating talk on the, the media's impact on mental health. We're with Tracy Alexander, who's now currently in Israel. She's a former Australian a Sydney, Sydney uh, person. Um, and she's worked as a news correspondent, a TV anchor, and also a mental health advocate. So that's on Tuesday night, I mean, on Wednesday night, and on Thursday night at eight o'clock, we're going to be doing the first of an at home series on, with myself and Rabbi Friedman from Sydney on how to enjoy the Chagim and make them meaningful from home. So wishing the two of you a Shana Tova, a healthy and sweet new year. And, um, Please God, the truth, the truth always prevails as we are taught. So certainly this truth um, that, you, that you're exposing, all the lies and, and deceit will certainly, uh, will certainly disappear and the truth will hopefully uh, come to the forefront. So thank you for your, your thank brave, you courageous work and thank you for allowing us to present this uh, talk to our congregation and to the Australian community. All right.